Thank you for joining us today um, for our perinatal mental health virtual learning series. This is the second of a two webinar series. And the focus of this institute is on raising awareness about and treating perinatal mental health and supporting providers who work with individuals affected by mental health symptoms during the prenatal and postpartum periods. We are very glad that you are here with us today. Next slide. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Meredith Shogren. I am a member of the Perinatal Mental Health Coordination Group with the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network. I am pleased to be your host for this session. I am pleased to introduce the session regarding evidence-based treatment for perinatal mental health um, disorders. I want to thank our wonderful speaker, Mara Asal Green, for being with us here today, and a big thanks to all of you for joining us. We truly hope that you find today's presentation engaging and helpful in your work. Next slide. Of course, we need to start out with some housekeeping items. Um, we have made every attempt to make today's presentation secure. If we need to end the presentation unexpectedly, we will follow up using your registration information. All attendees are muted and cannot share video. If you have a question for the presenter, please use the Q&A pod. Have a comment or a link for um, all attendees to see, then we encourage you to use the chat box. The session recording and slide deck will be posted on our website. If you attend at least half of this session, you will receive an email following the presentation on how to access a certificate of attendance. This event is captioned. To view captions, click the arrow beside the CC box at the bottom of your screen and choose show subtitles. To change the size of the subtitles, click the arrow next to the CC box and choose subtitle settings, where you'll find the option to make the subtitle smaller or larger. And if you don't already, we do encourage you to follow us on social media and to stay in touch with us. Next slide. We want to recognize that participating in this um, session, it may activate your own feelings and emotions. As mental health care providers, we also need to take care of ourselves. Please monitor yourself and practice good self-care, including taking breaks, stretching, drinking plenty of fluids, and practicing mindfulness or whatever helps you stay centered and grounded. If needed, we've also included links to helplines and hotlines. Next slide, please. Our SAMHSA-funded MHTTC network focuses on technology transfer, which means the adoption and implementation of evidence-based practices for mental health across the United States and territories. We develop and disseminate resources and provide free local and regional training and technical assistance for the mental health workforce. This is a map that displays our centers that make up the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network. We have 10 regional centers, a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and a network coordinating office. Please visit our website and find your center so that you may stay up to date on trainings and resources offered in your region. Next slide. The MHTTC network recognizes that the language we use has great significance and may positively or negatively contribute to the health and well being of the persons to whom we are communicating. We adopt a trauma informed recovery orientation as an overarching philosophy to guide our work in the mental health field and our language when speaking about people with lived experience of mental health conditions. As an example, our coordination group just learned that there are some discussion in the field right now about the use of the acronym PMAD for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. We received feedback that PMAD is not preferred by some, and this led us to instead begin using perinatal mental health conditions in our grant work. Next slide. This presentation was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in the presentation are the views of our speaker and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. Next slide. We have an amazing presenter with us here today and I'd like to introduce you to Mara Asel Green. Mara Asel Green, MSW LICSW, is a psychotherapist and owner of Strong Roots Counseling. 
Since 2001, Mara has worked in the Boston area with adolescents and adults. In addition to Mara's general practice, she has deep experience providing specialty treatment with mood and anxiety disorders during pregnancy and postpartum or the perinatal period. In addition to her private practice and adjunct faculty position at Northeastern University, Mara does trainings and workshops for clinicians, childbirth professionals, and families. Mara also has created a postmaster certificate for the use of CBT for perinatal emotional complications and offers that at Strong Roots Counseling. Mara's written work can be seen on the Huffington Post, as well as on her website, maragreen.com. Mara was trained at Smith School for Social Work and obtained a certificate in cognitive behavioral therapy at Boston University. Mara's approach combines her compassionate, non-judgmental approach and deep knowledge with humor, as appropriate, to help you toward your therapeutic goals. Mara, we thank you for being with, with us today, and I will now pass things off to you. Thanks so much, Meredy. Just wanna make sure everybody can see me, so I'm gonna wave, because I cannot yet see myself. You're good, okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, so the title of the talk, Birthing Healthier Families, CBT for the Treatment of Perinatal Emotional Complications. I know it's pretty exciting um, to start with a lecture that talks about the title of the talk, but I want you to take a moment and think about why this talk is not called Maternal Mental Health CBT for the Treatment of Postpartum Depression. Because all of our clients, all of the women that we serve are part of larger systems and they, we are about birthing the healthier family. And we think about this as perinatal emotional complications. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the spectrum of perinatal emotional complications. The language of perinatal emotional complications was, uh, I believe, designed by Liz Friedman and Nancy Byatt, who are both local folks here in the greater Boston area. That's where, shout out to the greater Boston area folks. Um, and they were talking about it is the term complications in the hopes that this would assist um, providers in particular in the medical world to sort of think about the most common complication of pregnancy, which is in fact an emotional complication. Um, Marianella, do you mind advancing, please? You all don't know this, but there's a lot of people behind the scene making this all work. All right, so before we start, I always start with a disclosure statement. Um, my intention, of course, is to provide the gifts and wisdom that I have learned from the clients and the um, education I have had over the years. Um, but of course, I bring blind spots as anybody does. And so I share with you um, the space in which I live and welcome the feedback both in the present as well as in, you know, feel free to reach out to me after if I have in some way um, offended, hurt, or unintentionally caused harm. Because uh, obviously, that is not my intention or goal. I really want this to be a comfortable space for everybody to learn. So I am a white, able-bodied, cisgender, heterosexual female who has worked in the greater Boston area since 2001. I've worked in public and private settings, including inpatient, outpatient, ran a substance use clinic, schools, social service agency, and have been in private practice in the Boston suburbs since 2010. Next. So if you do nothing else and you leave today with one piece of information, I hope that you leave with the box at the top. All forms of perinatal emotional complications are treatable and they are also the most common complication of pregnancy. I want you to think about that as an intervention. To share that information as a lactation professional, as a nurse midwife, as a uh, OBGYN, as any sort of mental health provider, or just as a loved one or friend, it is important to know that the most common complication of pregnancy is an emotional one. And that's why I love the language that Nancy and, um, and Liz helped uh, create, because I think that it really gives us that, that reinforcement. So just for the sake of conversation, I want to make sure we're all using the same kind of language. So when I talk about during pregnancy, I'll either use the word uh, 
prenatal or antenatal. And for those of you who don't work in a medical setting, sometimes clients will tell you that they were put onto an antenatal unit um, for some sort of health complication, not a psychiatric one. Um, after postpartum, and which again is why we don't call this a postpartum depression talk, because of course 60% of um, depression starts before birth. And that's where I think the, that the languaging matters. Uh, during and after pregnancy is perinatal. And I, we cannot miss our loss, folks, right? That there is a potential that you could have not just grief and loss, but the complications of pregnancy loss um, resulting in a um, mental health disorder. And then depression after adoption. And again, when you are doing your signage and you are welcoming folks who are postpartum for uh, new parenting groups, please make sure to emphasize that your, that your adopted babies and families are welcomed too. The rates are incredibly high for this population and they are incredibly underserved. Um, Marianella, next please. Okay, so we're gonna talk, there are two slides here. We're gonna do the range of perinatal emotional complications. So I will try to distinguish between my own interpretation of having done this work for the last um, number of years and what the literature says. And I think I mentioned um, that Felicia will have uh, posted a link to all of the resources that I use and citations, um, assume, or most of them, um, will be available on the website along with the, with the recording. All right, so postpartum baby blues, 50 to 85% of women. Um, I've heard other mental health professionals talk about this, that it is a not a mental health issue. This typically lasts about two weeks. Um, it should vary wildly. It should never have suicidal content. Um, I had a classic moment with one of my clients where I said, well, anybody else in your family experience any sort of perinatal mood or anxiety disorders and other emotional complications? She said, well, my sister had baby blues for a year. Folks, that is not really a baby blues, right? Anything that lasts sort of in a prolonged way really starts to fall into an evaluation for more, uh, for, uh, for a diagnosis of depressive disorder. Um, and the DSM-5 gives us a lot of flexibility now with unspecified depressive disorders. And we'll talk a little bit more about the DSM. So pregnancy depression. The stats, um, and I'll cite a lot from Kath, uh, Kathleen Wisner's large-scale study out of um, Chicago, a great, great study if you haven't taken a look at it. I think that the numbers are incredibly compelling, um, but she, she and her team were able to evaluate about 20% of pregnant women. So one in five is experiencing pregnancy, depression during pregnancy. Now, again, your risk for postpartum depression is if you have a pre-existing condition of depression or anxiety. So we should be screening absolutely um, all of our pregnant folks, even our preconception folks. The pregnancy anxiety, they clocked at about 10%. I have to tell you, this doesn't resonate with my experience. Um, I would certainly say that um, when talking talking to most of my colleagues, the prevalence of anxiety is incredibly high. The population of folks who are delivering now are all folks who um, are post-September 11th in terms of being adolescents. Um, and I think we've seen sort of like an overall rise in anxiety. Um, and we'll talk more about OCD. So that number feels depressed to me, but I, but of course I provide you only things that I have the statistics for. Postpartum depression, 21.9%. So you're going to see a lot of one in seven, one in eight. That number does not resonate for me in terms of the statistics. It really looks like it's one in five. Um, and actually the post-adoption incidence of depression is even higher than that, um, although I think that we don't have great statistics on it. So I just want you to be thinking about assessing people and doing some of these evaluative tools um, on folks who are, um, who are uh, post-adoptive. And again, think about it. Some of them have had a series of failed IVF. There could be a, they've had a bunch of grief and loss. Like there are a couple of reasons why they may be sort of like clinically set up or vulnerable for a depressed state. Um, I also will say that there are some large scale studies that do have the 14%, but that number just, as I said, just doesn't feel um, consistent with what the large scale studies uh, indicate. Postpartum anxiety, 17%, still feels underreported, but I'm willing to sit with it. And the reason that I highlight all of these ranges for you is, is that I want you to think about the order in which things happen. I actually think that the pregnancy anxiety is low, it's underreported, um, and that the fatigue of being that anxious can result in some depression. And CBT is a great way to treat mild to moderate um, anxiety and depression, um, as well as OCD, which is why we're going to be talking about it today. 
um, postpartum PTSD, high rates of trauma. Um, I think that you should also be thinking about spouse partners or folks who have attended births where there was risk to life and limb for mom and or baby should also be screened, especially when the delivery didn't go as expected. Uh, next, please. Great, thank you. So I want you to think about, take a breath into this. So the rates of OCD in the general population is in like the, I think it's like 1.7 or 2.3%. So we're talking about multiples um, of that, sometimes twice as much um, for true OCD and the postpartum rate. Um, OCS, which is obsessive compulsive symptoms, uh, clocks in at about 11.2% at two weeks postpartum and about 5% six months later. Great article just came out. Um, I'll suggest that all of you be following womensmentalhealth.org if you aren't already. And uh, Dr. Nonax released a most recent study, which says the numbers are even higher than that. Um, so I, I, I pulled that out. If we have a few minutes at the end, we'll talk more about even refining those numbers more. But you absolutely should be evaluating for um, the intrusive uh, thoughts and compulsive uh, routines and reassurance seeking patterns and behaviors. And to be very, very careful, you don't end up engaging in um, reassurance of your clients. And that's very tricky because we're providing psychoeducation to our families um, as well as, um, as treatment. Uh, so the postpartum bipolar, this one is incredibly tricky. Um, I have been unable to secure good research on this. We do know that the relapse rates for unmedicated folks who have a prior history of bipolar during pregnancy is 66%, um, which is obviously incredibly high, and 23% who still took their prophylactic meds. So again, our, our folks who live with bipolar disorder or bipolar 2 um, are exquisitely at risk during this time and should be followed particularly closely. Um, postpartum psychosis, obviously the thing that's making the um, headlines the most, but these are infinitesimally small numbers. Uh, for those of you who are working with partners, um, the study is called Sad Dads, um, but they actually did a great job of looking at perinatal uh, paternal depression at about 10%. The highest incidence is about three to six months um, post-delivery, so that's about 25% of the population. Uh, the the folks who have depression present in the months three to six. There is no solid research that I'm aware of, although welcome you to share it with me for um, same sex or uh, poly families and arrangements. Um, but I can only imagine because of some discrimination among other things that those numbers might even be higher. So I'd say this is me speculating. I don't have stats for it, but 10% um, feels like at base where we should be going and thinking about. So here's the really hard part, folks. Only about 17% of women get treatment for postpartum depression. And I've seen numbers as low as 7% for treatment. That's 83% of new families starting out um, of any of these mental health diagnoses underserved. So it's just thrilling that we're having today's conversation. There's so much more to learn and to do, um, but it, it is truly a uh, service to our families uh, when we get good at treating uh, these disorders to help um, to help families succeed. Next, please. Great, thanks. So one of the additions to the um, DSM-5, so our purple book, uh, was the peripartum specifier. So it was the um, the addition back into the into the pregnancy period. Um, so I just want to be real clear that this specifier can be applied. Again, if you're doing research during pregnancy and four weeks post-delivery, I want to also be incredibly clear that there's really nobody that I talk to who's doing this work in this field that, it, that adheres to this unless they are doing um, uh, traditional research. Most people will agree that uh, the onset can be around up to a year, and particularly vulnerable times are around... Um, uh, changes, so like the birth itself, changes in hormonal... Uh, you know, there's a cliff about three to four days postpartum um, when people get their first menstruation, um, if they're nursing, when they stop nursing. Um, so there are a couple of vulnerable times to sort of monitor. Uh, when people are presenting with psychotic features, in my experience and in the research that I've read, uh, the psychotic features typically present shortly thereafter if it's um, a true psychosis. If it's a 
depressive psychosis, you can watch people sort of like slowly unfold into it, um, which is of course incredibly painful and a reason to think about um, med consultations or earlier for this population in order to stabilize things. Next, please. Okay, so if just to familiarize yourself, and um, I'm not quite re yet ready, David, I'll kick it over to you in a second, but these are some screening tools. None of them are tests, okay? You obviously can use the Beck depression inventory. You can use the Beck anxiety inventory if those are comfortable um, screening tools. But I just want to highlight two of them for you. Um, the first one is the EPDS. David, can we have the EPDS go live, please? Thanks so much. So if you're looking for the EPDS, this is what it looks like. David, do you mind scrolling down to the second page? Okay, folks, this is the screening and the scoring, okay? It comes, it's been translated and validated into a number of languages. Um, again, most of us are not doing research. We just wanna take care of folks. So I feel very, very confident that you can use the translations. But to me, this is sort of like a quiz you would find in a magazine at the checkout line. Like the numbers add up. Um, but if you are giving this to clients, see how David is highlighting. David, can you underscore the uh, look, always look at item number 10? <laughs> Folks, that is your suicidal thoughts one. So if you are handing this out, but are going to screen afterwards, please, please make sure that you looked at uh, number 10. David, why don't you just head us over to the perinatal anxiety? Thank you. This is the pass, again, valid for both uh, pregnancy and postpartum. Um, love this one. Again, adding it down. These are my favorite kind of screening tools. And again, really, really easy to score. And if you can look at the black lines, for example, David, can you highlight between item 23 and 24? See those solid black lines? And if you scroll up to the page before, you'll see additional solid black lines. Each of those is separating. Um, basically, it, it, it chunks it up into possible uh, diagnostic categories. So it's particularly useful if you're sort of looking for like signs of PTSD or obsessive compulsive disorder or OCS. Um, great. David, can you pass that back over to Marianella, please? Great, thanks so much. Um, so the EPDS was one, two, and three there. And then the PHQ-2 and PHQ-9 are fine, but they're not sensitive for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders specifically. Great, thanks so much. Can you advance, please? So what are the reasons to get treatment, okay? So there is an impact of untreated depression and anxiety. So as I said, CBT is one of the treatments that has been um, identified as being particularly efficacious for folks who are living with mild to moderate depression, but it is worthwhile and, and obsessive compulsive disorder, of course, which is ERP. But it feels particularly important to sort of recognize that when people have untreated depression and anxiety, they often don't wanna get a med consultation. There's a variety of reasons for that, um, but it is important to recognize that, and again, we don't tell clients this, but it is important for you to think about that untreated depression and anxiety is often a risk to the developing fetus. And so again, without scaring clients that we're working with, we need to constantly do the sort of mental math with them about risk benefit um, in the consultation. So several caregiving activities appear to be compromised by postpartum depression, including feeding practices, most, most especially breastfeeding, sleep routines, and well-child visits, and vaccinations, and safety practices. This data highlights the need for universal screening of maternal and paternal depression during the postpartum period. In Massachusetts, we have just an unbelievable program. I think really one of the field leaders around this, which is called the MCPAP program, M-C-P-A-P. -P. We offer um, mcpapformoms.org is a website, www.mcpapformoms. Um, and it's just an unbelievable doctor doc consultation service for folks who are considering medication but may not have the expertise. So for those of you who are doing state level policy, please find your way to Dr. Nancy Byatt, among others, uh, just an incredible program here in Massachusetts. Marianella, next please. Okay, so additional impacts. So resources have attributed the long-term effects of maternal depression, including behavior problems, cognitive delays, and physical health problems due to disturbed um, early interactions. So again, consequences for attachment, consequences for feeding practices, self-care, among other things. So 
this is real important folks to recognize that number that I gave you quite early on about the, the only 17% are getting treated, which is amazing, but we got to get that number up because obviously all the families are sort of relying on us to, to do better and to get folks to where they need to go. And again, I think that some of the screening reservation that people have, and I know Dr. Uh, Creer Perry uh, talked about this in her presentation on May 5th, which I believe is available now as a recorded uh, presentation, um, talked about like people are worried about screening because they don't have enough clinicians. So the fact that you are here um, is just incredible. We need more folks who are going to be able to, to take care of these and treat these illnesses. Okay, next please. Great. Um, there are additional risks for women of color. I'm, I, I hope at this point, this is not new information to you. Again, if you missed Dr. Creer Perry's uh, piece on the impact of racism uh, on maternal mental health um, uh, or have just been sort of consuming I don't know, like the news, among other things. I hope I hope that this is not news to you, um, that that racism plays in a significant role in increasing the risk for mental healthiness for um, women of color. Um, but if not, let me be the first one to tell you that this is a, this is an epidemic, um, and it's important to recognize that that 19% of new mothers jumps to 38% when we talk about new mothers of color. Next slide, please. So we're going to watch a small video. Um, I want you to think about two particular things when we're watching this video. Um, we're going to think about it in terms of anxiety and then PTSD. I just saw a fabulous presentation. Dr. Barbara Stroud gave a presentation last week on um, implicit bias um, and racism in screening and attachment questions. And she just is asking all of these really important questions about um, what is the attachment relationship between the folks in the United States and BIPOC folks? And she just absolutely uh, blew the lid off of that question. And so I want you to think about anxiety. I want you to think about trauma. I want you to think about racism. I want you to be thinking particularly about families that are not arranged in um, you know, straight cisgender arrangements and how they may be treated throughout the conception process, the IVS process, the adoption process, the pregnancy process, the birth process. Um, and remember, it's not just your client who's in the room, but it's the whole constellation of the family and the arrangement, whoever it is. Um, I'm not sure who's starting the video and I apologize, but I think that's David. So most of you can probably relate to what I'm feeling right now. My heart is racing in my chest. My palms are a little bit clammy. I'm sweating. And my breath is a little bit shallow. Now these familiar sensations are obviously the result of standing up in front of a thousand of you and giving a talk that might be streamed online to perhaps a million more. But the physical sensations I'm experiencing right now are actually the result of a much more basic mind-body mechanism. My nervous system is sending a flood of hormones, like cortisol and adrenaline, into my bloodstream. It's a very old and very necessary response that sends blood and oxygen to the organs and muscles that I might need to respond quickly to a potential threat. But there's a problem with this response, and that is that it can get overactivated. If I face these kinds of stressors on a daily basis, particularly over an extended period of time, uh, my system can get overloaded. So basically, if this response happens infrequently, super necessary for my well-being and survival. But if it happens too much, it can actually make me sick. There's a growing body of research examining the relationship between chronic stress and illness. Things like heart disease and even cancer are being shown to have a relationship to stress. And that's because, over time, too much activation from stress can interfere with my body's processes that keep me healthy. Now let's imagine for a moment that I was pregnant. What might this kind of stress, particularly over the length of my pregnancy, what kind of impact might that have on the health of my developing fetus? Now you probably won't be surprised when I tell you that this kind of stress during pregnancy is not good. It can even cause the body to initiate labor too early because, in a basic sense, the stress communicates that the womb is no longer a safe place for the child. Stress during pregnancy is linked with things like high blood pressure and low infant birth weight. 
and it can begin a cascade of health challenges that make birth much more dangerous for both parent and child. Now, of course, stress in our, particularly in our modern lifestyle, is a somewhat universal experience, right? Maybe you've never stood up to give a TED talk, but you faced a big presentation at work, a sudden job loss, a big test, a heated conflict with a family member or friend. But it turns out that the kind of stress we experience, and whether we're able to stay in a relaxed state long enough to keep our bodies working properly, depends a lot on who we are. There's also a growing body of research examining that showing that people who experience more discrimination are more likely to have poor health. Even the threat of discrimination, like worrying you might be stopped by police while driving your car, can have um, can have an impact, a negative impact on your health. Harvard professor Dr. David Williams, the person who pioneered the tools that have proven these linkages, says that the more marginalized groups in our society experience more discrimination and more impacts on their health. So I've been interested in these issues for over a decade. Uh, when I became interested in maternal health, when a failed pre-med trajectory instead sent me down a path looking for other ways to help pregnant people. I became a doula, a lay person trained to provide support to people during pregnancy and childbirth. And because I'm Latina and a Spanish speaker, in my first volunteer doula gig at a public hospital in North Carolina, I saw clearly how race and class impacted the experiences of the women that I supported. If we take a look at the statistics about the rates of illness during pregnancy and childbirth, we see clearly the pattern outlined by Dr. Williams. African-American women in estimate those rates in sub-Saharan Africa. In those same communities, the rates for white women are near zero. Even nationally, black women are four times more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth than white women. Four times more likely to die. They're also twice as likely for their infants to die before the first year of life than white infants. And two to three times more likely to give birth too early or too skinny, a sign of insufficient development. Native women are also more likely to have higher rates of these problems than white women, as are some groups of Latinas. For the last decade, as a doula turned journalist and blogger, I've been trying to raise the alarm about just how different the experiences of women of color, but particularly black women, are when it comes to pregnancy and birth in the US. But when I tell people about these appalling statistics, leaving you on a cliffhanger, folks. You're going to have to watch the rest by yourselves. All right. So I'd like for you to just take a moment, like I did at the beginning of the presentation, um, to talk, to think a little bit about your own intersectionality. So Marianella, do you mind advancing to the next? Thank you. So we're going to talk about the intersectionality of ourselves, because when you think about CBT, um, I, I have to admit, I was trained in a, a very dynamic framework, and so I think I had some prejudice against CBT as being particularly manualized um, and candidly a little bit cold. But I really want to reinforce that I think that we don't need to eliminate all that great dynamic learning that we've already all had. But I, I really need for you to think about who you are in the room because that will impact your client's willingness to both share and participate in the tasks that CBT really requires of them, which are in some cases, and particularly for OCD, doing some, some experiments that will actively increase their distress. And so the quality of relationship that you have with your client absolutely, I think, will play a role in the success of CBT should you choose to um, evaluate that as being an appropriate intervention. Marianella, do you mind? advancing. Oh, look, you guys, my, my slides are working. I just could not be more thrilled. All right. So let's take a moment and reflect on your own intersectionality. And at the same time, or shortly after, I want you to think about a particular client that you've worked with and sort of think about their intersectionality. I want you to think about everything from your able-bodiedness, maybe your race, class, your own sexual orientation or theirs, 
and all of the ways in which that may have impacted their perinatal experience, their experience of therapy in the past or with you. And specifically, we're gonna talk about how it may impact the use of CBT. So let's just take, you know, pull out a piece of paper, close your eyes, I can't see you. Um, do whatever feels right, but just sort of conjure somebody to mind and let's think together about how we're going to help that person get the care they both deserve and need. And as you hold them in your mind or in your heart, thinking a little bit about who you are and how you bring yourself into the room. So if we could advance, please, Marianella. Thanks. So uh, Campbell Sills and Barlow, David Barlow, who uh, is at Boston University and, and is quite well known in the wor world of CBT, talks about negative affect in this way. So if you follow along the top okay, that you have an emotion you perceive as intolerable or unacceptable, like a negative thought about yourself or anxiety, you engage in efforts to suppress that sort of uncomfortable feeling, either through avoidance or some sort of um, repetitive activity or some sort of compulsion, and that suppression fails, which then reinforces that the negative affect then follows along the top. The top. Over time, the sort of idea of um, particularly ERP, which is exposure and response prevention, um, as well as uh, teaching people to name and notice their distress, imagine it as tolerable, and then to get curious about investigating it, is that the emotion is perceived as tolerable and acceptable, right? We are people. If there's a word for it, humans experience that feeling and emotion. Um, we engage in no suppression. We allow that feeling to come without judgment. And then that mood recovers naturally over time. Again, easier said than done, of course. This is where our, um, our training around DBT skills and strategies, MBSR, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and mindfulness all are available to sort of assist us in sitting with that discomfort. Now, what I really want you to think about is what are the barriers to people experiencing their emotions as being tolerable and acceptable? And you may need to do some preliminary work with folks to figure out where, where do their feelings come from? How are those feelings um, sort of tolerated in their culture so that you don't jump forward too quickly? Um, and that's where the CBT, I think, sometimes fails is, is a lack of awareness on the part of the therapist to truly understand what it would take for this person to experience emotion as tolerable, acceptable. The other place where I feel like CBT is not always as successful is when people are having active anxiety or panic. And I really believe that our grounding strategies, the things you've learned in, learned in trauma-based work, as well as um, DBT, are to be used in advance of some of the cognitive and behavioral strategies of CBT. I think there probably is a much larger conversation there. But that's sort of my perception, is, is that when your lizard brain is activated, accessing your prefrontal cortex to make determinations about naming and noticing your emotions and challenging them feels really unavailable to the clients that I work with. Next slide, please. Podesky, which uh, wrote Mind Over Mood, um, gives us another way of thinking about it. So um, the thoughts, the moods, the behavior and physical reactions are all sort of like seeped in our environment. We are people in places. We are not plucked out and having mental health concerns unrelated to the world around us. That's part of where I feel like the, the lack of sort of humanizing of experience. We are not looking for people to be automatons, right? When you right size or box up your emotions, they may still be intense. They're just not debilitating right? When you are grieving, grief is real and oftentimes heavy and painful, um, but uh, it may also move into an arena which impairs your ability to function. So what I love about this model of life experience is it also for people who are not able to quickly name their thoughts and or their feelings, um, it does give us an opportunity to say, well, if my stomach hurts, right? Or I'm getting tight over the back of my neck or I'm clenching my jaw and I'm waking up every morning with, with jaw pain or a headache. Um, so I think that this, this uh, visual also for me gives a lot of room for the sort of physical and somatic reactions, which feel very real, right? Our guts are absolutely a second brain. Um, Marianella, next slide, please. 
So what is CBT? Amy Wenzel writes, CBT is a time-limited structured form of psychotherapy, and it has two main targets, cognition and behaviors, okay? So these are not um, hard and fast rules, um, but I think we'll, we'll really talk about uh, three aspects of, of CBT. So the role of cognitive restructuring, which is a lot of when you think of like a thought record um, uh, or yeah, we'll just call it a thought record. The uh, role of exposure and response prevention for anxiety and specifically for OCD, which of course we will just not have time um, to find our way to, but I invite you to uh, Dr. Abramowitz's work. And then my favorite podcast is the OCD stories where there are lots of thoughtful people doing that work um, and the role of behavioral activation for depression, right? Now, obviously, the role of cognitive restructuring is func functions for both anxious and depressive thoughts, um, but sometimes in order to feel better, we just have to do things differently. And again, the doing of the thing differently is uh, easier said than done. But um, knowing, going all the way back to those early slides of like, what we think might be going on helps us to sort of design um, our treatment plans. I have to be honest that some depression that I end up seeing is for significant intrusive untreated anxiety, which people have just been living with for a long time and their systems have been so activated and agitated for so long, they are just spent. And so what's curious is, is when you actually treat the depression and it recedes a little bit. Um, also, I see this sometimes with Lexapro and people sort of the depression is appropriately managed, but the anxiety looks very still unmanaged. Um, that's one of the things that I think about is, is like, was the anxiety pre-existing? Marianella, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a very traditional session format. And, you know, there's no way in the next 20 minutes I can introduce you to, you know, all things CBT. Um, but if you look at um, Judith Beck's book as like an introductory to CBT session format, this is a little bit of what you'll see. So after the first, again, rapport building, assessment and diagnostic phase, a regular session looks often something like this. So some people do a 10 point scale. Now, again, you're gonna have to reorient all of those people in, in academia. A five is neutral, right? Because if a seven, a 70 is neutral, we don't have much room to go up, but we got a lot of room to go down. So I, we really try to reorient people to neutrality. What is it like to just sit in neutral? That it is okay as people not to always feel great. And I always say 10 is like, you know, these are like lifetime achievement feelings, you know, so people who want to live in the world of 10, um, that feels like Disney to me. Um, and then, and then one is at the bottom. And for those of you who are looking for an app for this, again, um, it's only available currently on the Apple products, but I really like Mood Kit. It's a one-time $4.99 uh, fee, and I really like that app. I find that people just have their phones with them. Um, not all of our my, uh, particularly moms, have access to an Apple product, um, so I have lots of paper versions of this. Um, but we review aspirations. I never use the word homework, even though I know CBT does, um, because that gives room for failure, and I I always tell my clients being present in the room is enough. Um, they are enough, but I often talk about it as aspirations or goals between visits or sessions. But again, just to familiarize you with the CBT work language, setting agendas like, hey, if we only have 35 minutes or 40 minutes today, what are the things that are your top priorities? Um, identify focus or problem of that agenda. So that sort of always recognizing that we had to let some things go. Um, assigning goals at the end. And then of course, eliciting feedback and checkout. Next slide, please. Great. So what are some, so CBT talks a lot about automatic thoughts. I think of these as the unbidden things that sort of come to mind, right? So um, internalized narratives, if you sort of follow Michael White's work, but there are lots of ways to think about automatic thoughts. But to me, this is the low hanging fruit of like, without even pausing, this is what my brain told me. Okay, so when we're teaching clients to recognize and name anxious thoughts, part of it is, is we have to say, we're not going to judge our thoughts. Hey, folks, that's not easy, but we're going to try to practice just writing them down, right? So what are some examples of automatic thoughts? Before we uh, just hang tight for one second, Marianella, I'd like you to give yourself just a moment to think about an automatic thought. A thought that came up for me, you know, a few minutes ago when I was sort of preparing for today is, is you know, I, I hope that the tech works. I hope that they really like the presentation. Those would be examples of automatic thoughts, right? Folks who live, who don't live with, for example, OCD, 
might have an automatic thought of, oh, I think I, uh, if I, if I turned my car here, I could hit that light pole and die, right? But again, if I don't have OCD, I might think to myself, like, gosh, I really, like, my brain is really on the fritz today. It's sending me all sorts of what ifs. I don't need these what ifs, right? But if you live with OCD, then you might have this intrusive thought that if it occurred to you, then you need to spend some time unpacking it and challenging it, right? But like, I'm, I'm not worried that I'm homicidal today. I just had, the, had that thought or suicidal. So Marianella, can you please advance into the automatic thoughts? So some examples of thoughts for women during the perinatal period. These are examples from uh, folks that I've worked with. So if I was stronger, I would not have needed the epidural. I wanted this baby, so I did this to myself. If I get help, it will mean I failed. And by the way, showing up for help from you could also be a sign that they are failing. You are a sign of their failure. Other women do this all the time. What is wrong with me? So we have to be really, really careful not to reassure, but to explore. What is the meaning of that thought? Where did that thought come from? How much do they actually subscribe to that thought? Or is it just like a thought because our brains are blurpy and send us weird messages sometimes? Is this one of those kinds of thoughts? I want you to think about a thought that client may have said to you once where you thought to yourself, wow, it's so unfair that that is a thing that her brain told her in this moment. All right, Ella, next slide. So one of the other parts about CBT is we have to get really good at helping people name feelings. Now, here's a problem, folks. We are awful at naming feelings. In fact, sometimes people call things anxiety and depression, but those are not even really the feelings themselves. David, do you mind uh, posting up the feelings list from Hoffman, please? So what I particularly like about this list, uh, I don't know anything about the Hoffman Institute if I'm completely candid, but I really like how they, ha they really push into specificity, right? The idea of like, envy that your baby sleeps through the night or that the jealousy that somebody else's nursing experience is going well or the anger and bitterness that you have that somebody else's birth went the way that they had hoped. David, can you continue to go down into the body sensations? And then what I love here is, is that it gives us names for bodily sensations, which I just feel like we are so removed from as grown-ups, um, that buzzy burning. I mean, when I say it, I think I know what it feels like, but I don't, these are not words that typically come up. So people will narrow their language around uh, guilt. See how there's a heading for guilt, but then, ooh, there's a whole lot of choices. Or if you go up, uh, right, and if you go continue to scroll up a little further, you can see it actually got stressed. Stress is not just one word. Oh, well, do I really feel depleted? Do I feel cranky? Am I overwhelmed? Well, those might be different things. Um, disconnected, right? Edgy. So I am absolutely a firm believer in giving out feelings lists as well as um, a cognitive distortions list, which is what we're gonna come to next. Two clients through our portal, if we're in, you know, if all goes well, hopefully we'll all be back in session safely um, soon. Uh, we can hand these things because we wanna make the process of CBT easier for people um, because the work is hard, right? So the investigation is hard. We don't need to make this part hard. And to remind people, the goal is not to be an automaton. The goal is to be a person who recognizes the full range of human experience. These words, folks, these words are things that people experience and we just have to help them name it. David, can we go back to Marianella, please? Thanks so much. So in CBT, we have like a process, right? So we're going to name and notice a situation, right? We're going to recognize maybe those feelings or the thoughts first. So those automatic thoughts, maybe the feelings. And the next thing we have to do then is investigate, well, what are the things that might amplify, turn up, give us depression glasses, give us anxiety glasses? So Marianella, can we go to the next page, which is some of our cognitive distortions? Um, I often uh, 
quickly name the phrase cognitive distortion because that is a CBT term, but I back off from it pretty quick and I talk about it as the amplification of distress. Now, one of the things is I'm going to walk through this list in the second list, but I want you to start thinking about diagnostically which one of these cognitive distortions might accompany a particular diagnosis. So for example, all or nothing thinking, blaming, catastrophizing, downplaying positives, emotional reasoning, intolerance of uncertainty. So for example, intolerance of uncertainty often, but not always, for me is an example of possible OCD diagnosis, a potential anxiety diagnosis, and particularly when it travels with catastrophizing, right? It's like, I know something awful is going to happen and I can't wait to find out if it actually is, understandably is gonna cause somebody to engage in a reassurance seeking behavior or a compulsion. So we're gonna have some appreciation for how the cognitive distortion works, whether or not people actually subscribe to it. And when they're sort of backing themselves away from it, what are the ways in which we can, again, work towards the cognitive restructuring. Next slide, please. Another one, labeling, jumping to conclusions about others' thoughts. So this engages in mind reading or fortune telling. Uh, that feels very depressing. So people will typically say, I think other people are thinking that I'm, I am X, right? Incredibly distressing thoughts, but then they behave as if that thing is true. That's the emotional reasoning. And so now emotional reasoning and jumping to conclusions or mind reading are now traveling together and I'm behaving as if, well, we don't behave in as if, um, I'm the therapist who wants less feelings and more data. So now I'm going to start to collect some data. It's like, well, how do you know? Not accepting, so rehashing past and unable to move forward. That's that anchoring of depression in the past, right? Overgeneralizing, so sweeping conclusions about a small incident. Personalizing, relating events to you. Should or must statements. Uh, one of my colleagues, Peggy Kaufman, just an incredible uh, educator and, and uh, clinician in the Boston area, talks about uh, you should all over yourself. I think she told me that it came from Al-Anon. Al-Anon is just phenomenal for these kinds of things, but should. These should or must, these rigid and flexible sort of like rules of how you have to behave or how others have to behave and holding yourselves to those rules. And then folks, you must not forget that not everything is distorted. Sometimes a negative feeling is truly a negative feeling and it is a right-sized reaction. So the goal is not to eliminate people from having feelings, we're just trying to get them to right-size them. So that's the way I think the real gift of CBT is, is like, what does the data say? What is real? How do I make sense of this? How do I wanna respond? And then giving us choices. Next slide, please. Okay, so this one, I get to sort of, assigned to myself because this was my idea. But when you're doing cognitive restructuring, I think one of the things that I was really taught in terms of the cognitive restructuring was taking the data, collecting it, challenging the thought, and then sort of figuring out what happens next. I think the piece that for me is really missing in the cognitive restructuring is the compassion. So one of my things that I often send clients back to do, folks that I know well have good relationships with, is, is that we, I send them back and I say, I want you to say one thing to yourself that is both real, true, and compassionate. Like, it stinks. It's hard. I feel a lot of envy. I am feeling incredibly sad that my birth didn't go the way that I wanted it to. And so I feel sad for myself that that experience was not what I had anticipated. And I want people to practice, not just from us, but practice giving to themselves compassion. And the, the language of CBT often invites us to talk about what would you say to a friend, right? And so that's where I think that, that sort of compassion, and that's where I use a lot of the MBSR uh, as like an adjunctive for folks, is just to practice just like noticing, naming, and then with compassion saying like, hey, here's where I'm at, real unfortunate. And then the question is, is like, okay, I had all of those automatic thoughts, like this is never going to end. I'm never going to be able to put this baby to sleep. I'm never going to be able to sue this baby. This baby is going to hate me forever, right? And I'm going to say, well, what are my clues that all of this is real true in this moment, right? Well, now I have to do a data collection, right? My baby's looking at me, my baby's cooing at me. And this is where that, you know, that bonding stuff, that attunement and attachment, again, when babies are with us, we can say, what do you think that baby's thinking right now? 
right? Well, how do you know? It's all of this projective stuff, right? And trying to do the data collection. I'm a terrible mom. Well, baby looks like it's wearing clothes with, that you were able to provide. It's securely, snugly, sort of in your arms or in the car seat. You're making every reasonable effort to get it diapers or to secure, you know, benefits to be able to get yourself some formula, right? So what is the data that I'm a terrible parent? Show me the ways in which, because that I think is an emotional reasoning. That's a feeling. And I understand that that thought and that feeling feel very real, but we don't have data to align with that. You're taking every reasonable step to secure housing for your baby. You are actually housing your baby. You are trying to get a job, right? So there are all of these efforts and we need to, again, celebrate them and then move to choice. So how do you want to handle this? What could you say to yourself that would be different? And that's my favorite part is, is that it gives these actionable steps back to clients. So I call these the three C's, compassion, challenge, and choice. Okay, so the exposures. This is not something we're gonna wrap up in seven minutes. So enough, suffice it to say that when you're ex engaging in ERP, which is that, that exposure and response prevention, that is again, the like gold standard treatment for um, OCD, um, I invite you to familiarize yourself with, um, again, some people talk about exposure hierarchy in a ladder. So there's now some collapsing of that ladder and there's a lot of discussion in the field of OCD. I invite you to familiarize yourself. International OCD Foundation, IOCDF has some really great resources, videos, among other things, um, as you're starting to settle yourself into that work. Um, but there are three really different kinds of exposure. So one of which is an imagined exposure of the feared situations. I am scared of, for example, snakes. And so I imagine myself exposing, uh, being exposed to a snake, by the way, not fun. Interoceptive is um, inducing the feared physical sensation. So for example, like an interoceptive would be, um, I had a pregnant um, woman who was having panic attacks. And so we would practice having her run until she could sort of have a hard time breathing. And then she would practice sitting and experiencing having a hard time breathing, but knowing it wasn't a panic attack, that would be an interoceptive. And in vivo is the exposure to a feared situation, stroking the snake. Okay, so I think we have enough time. So Marianella, we're gonna aspire here to tackle this next slide, which is the sample situation. Sorry, next please. Oh, I seem to have lost my next slide. All right, well, I'm gonna continue on until the slide comes back up. I can't quite see, uh, Felicia's telling us she's pulling it up. I went old school, covered up all of your comments and now I don't know what anybody's doing, but we're gonna continue forward. Um, and I hopefully this sample situation, but I've got my trusty notes, so here we go. So the situation, so again, if you were gonna do a thought record, the situation or the client presents as uh, unsuccessful in soothing the baby and ends up lying on their bed crying. Full stop, that's the situation. Now, I've eliminated any of the identifying information here uh, just for ease, not because I don't think that the cultural, racial ability, among other things, wouldn't impact the treatment, but just to make this bite-sized, I, I felt I needed to eliminate those things. So please, please know that that was intentional, um, but to also not interpret this as being for, for white folks. Okay. So um, they present in your office or telehealth, and these are the automatic thoughts. I'm a terrible parent. I don't know what to do. Nothing I'm doing is helping. I think she would be better off with another parent, someone who can actually soothe her. I'm gonna call the pediatrician's office and find out if they can see us so they can tell me what's wrong with this baby. So the language I wanna make sure that you don't miss is the passive suicidal thought that this baby would be better off with a different parent. So that should be a clue to you to do a, to, do a hard stop, pause, screen, and then come back. Ah, look at that. Thanks, Felicia. Now I no longer have to take my glasses on and off. One more time on the advance so that we can get the second part up. Super, thank you so much. See folks, all of our back 
back and forth in advance was was great for this. So now I would have the person sort of line these things up. So the situation, they often want to tell me all the circumstances that went into the situation. And again, for ease, we want people just to get into a habit of saying like, here's what happened. They may not know the trigger situation. So I just tell them to put an X because it doesn't matter what the trigger was. Here's what I find myself doing. Here's what I find myself thinking. And here's what I find myself feeling, right? And so this is where you would take that list of feelings. You would help them to identify the series of automatic thoughts, regardless of whether or not they think it's true, but just sort of blurping it all out. I often encourage people to use the notes section of their phone, a Google Doc, a talk to text, especially because moms can often do this baby bottle like this or baby to breast. And then they're sort of can do talk into their phone if they have it um, or scribe to somebody else. And then the question is, is, okay, are there any of those cognitive distortions, right? Those thinking traps that we know, and most people have a pattern of thinking traps that they typically engage in, right? Fan favorite is like emotional reasoning or a different fan favorite might be intolerance of uncertainty, right? So in this particular case, there's a, there's a lot of labeling, terrible parent, right? Nothing I'm doing is helping. So that's an all or nothing distortion. I think she'd better off with another parent, someone who can actually soothe her. Again, that's a lot about blaming and labeling and also a time to do a screening for safety. I'm gonna call the pediatrician's office and tell me what's wrong with the baby. So what, seeking out that reassurance, right? So now I'm engaging in an avoidance strategy of like, sometimes babies just cry and it's really painful. Understanding for people why their baby is crying distress is causing them so much distress. It could be because they're not sleeping. It could be because there's been no breaks. It could be because there's, you know, like a health concern. It could be that this was a baby who was in the NICU and they had a lot of reassurance when the baby was in the NICU in terms of beeps and um, nursing and now they're home and they don't feel that same sense of confidence. So there can be so many reasons to be compassionate. So it must be really hard not to know why your baby is crying. Let's just breathe into like, what's coming up for you around the tearfulness? Why is this causing you so much distress? Let's understand that. And again, that might be an opportunity to explore more deeply or again, very surface level. And then what's the data that this baby, that you're never going to soothe her? And what's your data that this baby would be better off with another parent? And what's your data that nothing you're doing is helping, right? So let's explore that. Let's look for cognitive traps. Right? And then let's make a choice. Do you need to just take a break? Like the baby's crying either way. You haven't yet figured out if it's a passy or you tried the diaper or you burped them or you did all the things that were sort of available. And before you try again, what if you just like baby's crying anyway? Like what if you put the baby in a crib and walk away, make sure they're on a safe space because they're going to cry either way and maybe just breathe for a minute or go get a glass of water or go to the bathroom by yourself and then return and let's try again right? That's a choice, right? Or call a friend or you could call the pediatrician. That's fine. Or you can, if there's a partner available or a neighbor, can somebody come home earlier and give you a little bit of a reprieve? Cause baby either will stop crying or not. Right. But we're going to try all the things and forgiving ourselves for not being a parent who relieves children of all pain and distress. That one is really fascinating. There seems to be like an anxious, perfectionistic, performative, something that parents think that they can take away pain from their children. And let's both have compassion for who wouldn't want to do that. For those of us who are parents, I think most of us would say like, that sounds better. Um, and teaching our babies, our children to survive discomfort, right? is part of our job and sitting and witnessing and noticing with them. And so sometimes saying to the parent, let's say out loud to the baby, baby, you are so something right now. I don't know what you're thinking or feeling and crying, I hope is making you to feel better. And I'm going to try all of these things to work it out. We're in this together. And that gives parents choice and options that they couldn't see when they were just reacting and reacting and reacting. So let's take a pause there. Let's come to the last slide. Uh, these are all the great ways that you can find me. Um, you can call me. <laughs> That's my picture. That's my website. You can email me. Um, Felicia is also going to throw into the chat. We have a 12 hour um, certificate for perinatal um, emotional complications coming up on June 7th and 8th. So if you thought this 
was a fun hour long teaser. Let's spend 12 hours together um, and talk about this more. So I'm going to kick this back over to Meredy. I, I'm hopeful that there are some questions in the chat um, and I think we've got some time for them. Okay. Hi, Mara. Thank you so very much. Just a wonderful presentation. And we thank you so much for your expertise. We do have um, a question in the Q&A pod, but before we get to that question, I just would like to preface this for all attendees to know that we are not able to offer individual medical advice as part of this webinar. And so if there is a person with lived experience who maybe has questions about perinatal depression and anxiety, we strongly encourage you to visit with your personal healthcare provider to answer those questions. Now, I would, I would like, though, to kind of turn things into a general type of a question. So do you have any suggestions for education, so preconception education or pre-birth education um, for a person if, if they have a history of, of uh, postpartum depression, perinatal depression and anxiety, and they're contemplating maybe having a second pregnancy or looking into adoption, what would general education kind of look like for those families who have experienced perinatal depression and maybe would like to expand their family? So, I mean, I think I'm a little biased in my answer here, Meredy, because of course I think that um, a couple of sessions with a uh, licensed clinician to sort of help think through risk factors, potential interventions, med consultation, among other things, and sometimes just unpacking the fact that they did have um, an emotional complication that either went treated or untreated as they're anticipating next steps in expanding their families feels incredibly critical. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with, and this is by the way, an international organization, and I saw at the beginning is Postpartum Support International. Every single state has a warm line. Um, by the way, a difference between a warm line and a hotline, just so you know, is you leave a message and someone will get back to you. A hotline is when they actually pick up. Um, so these are typically warm lines. You can provide information about your where you're located. And of course, telehealth has really transformed people's ability to get to uh, trained perinatal um, clinicians. So I would say certainly some candor with your um, healthcare team. So to your point, like reaching out to your PCP, if you're going to be adopting and maybe you're not necessarily being followed by um, an OB, a midwife, or some other uh, healthcare team or provider. If you have a psychiatrist, exploring with that psychiatrist, whether or not they have comfort and confidence in prescribing during the perinatal period. Um, and if they don't, how to help them either get consultation to stay with them or take a break from that person, work with someone who's more perinatal expertise and then return back. Um, so I, I would say in general, educating yourself around the range of perinatal um, mood and anxiety disorders uh, and emotional complications can be helpful. I send all my clients to uh, women's men womensmentalhealth.org, which is out of the Mass General, free resources, um, lots of incredible resources, as I said, on Postpartum Support International. And I just, I, again, just shout out to PSI. Um, they offer an incredibly wide array of resources, not just English and Spanish, but they have support groups for um, uh, particularly BIPOC women, DESI women. Um, they offer support groups in Spanish um, and for dads. Um, so I just want to say that there are just in an, a number of free resources that are available. Um, also, if you uh, are looking for folks who have had NICU experience or fragile beginnings, because those are folks who understandably have high rates of grief and loss, uh, risk for um, perinatal anxiety and depression, as well as OCD checking behaviors come up a lot after a NICU stay. Um, fragile beginnings out of Jewish Family and Children's Services in Boston area is an incredible resource and they can they can guide you, especially if you're in the Boston area or in Massachusetts. Okay. Is that your question, Meredy? Yes. Thank Great. you very much. And I think we just have time for one more question. And um, this has come up. It says, do, do you um, know what the research has to say about EMDR, therapy for perinatal postpartum birth trauma anxiety? Um, any, any thoughts in that area or directions we can send folks? Yeah, thanks so much. EMDR, I mean, if you can get it, it's phenomenal for single incident trauma, um, birth trauma being one. We definitely um, can do conjunctive therapy if uh, if the provider is open to that. Otherwise, I not uncommonly will send people out with single incident trauma um, for some EMDR as a component of their care and treatment. Huge fan. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And I think with that, 
We have just a couple minutes left that we need to address a few other slides. So I'll ask Marinella to please advance to the next slide. And again, thank you so much, Mara. We just wanted to um, present you with some additional information mm -hmm. on perinatal mental health. And we do encourage you to um, check out our new website. Um, and we've got the link here for you to look for future events and upcoming um, events and resources. Um, and uh, next slide, please. And then we do ask that you would take a moment to complete a brief survey about today's session. Um, it's coming up here with our QRS code. Your um, feedback is very important to us and you will be redirected to the survey when you close your um, Zoom platform and that will allow you to participate in this um, particular survey. I promise it's very short with just a couple questions um, and not painful at all. So we, we would thank you in advance for completing that. And then in closing, we'd just like to say thank you to everyone today for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us today, Mara, and thank you to all who did attend um, our presentation today. Our slides and our recording will be available um, on our website, and we give us a little grace. Um, it takes a couple of weeks or so, and then everything will be posted there for you to view. So with that, we thank you all so much.